Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our first class session of the course, Journalism Under Siege. I'm Charlie Yunkerman, and I'll be your continuing studies host tonight. Um, do a little bit of introduction and some housekeeping before we get underway. Uh, housekeeping first. Um, I don't want to use up any more of the precious time of our uh, class session tonight, so I'll make this quick. If you have questions about attendance, credit, that sort of thing, class-related questions, you can ask me after class. I'll be around. And also tomorrow, Amy Tolafield from our staff is going to be sending around an email with those sorts of issues. So stand by for the email. Um, Dawn, uh, Dawn Garcia and Michael Bolton, who are the hosts for the entire sequence of our class sessions, will explain when they get up on stage how the course is going to go, how it's structured. So I'm not going to pretend to do that now, but you'll get it as soon as uh, Dawn comes up and does her introduction of the core of the course. You may notice, uh, although it's unobtrusive, uh, that we're videotaping this course. Uh, there's a Stanford video is in the back. We'll videotape all five sessions, and they'll be uploaded to YouTube after the course is finished. Uh, now, one of the consequences of videotaping is that we can't have you ask questions in your own voice without getting a waiver from each one of you who stands up to ask a question, which is impossible. So instead, what we're going to do is that staff from the Knight Fellowships uh, program will be circulating through the audience, yes, during the class session with three by five cards and passing them down the rows. So if a question occurs to you, you can write one out and it will get up to stage to the speakers, okay? Sorry for that clunkiness, but it's, you know, what we have to, have to deal with once we start videoing. There will be a 10 minute break um, after the first hour. So at eight o'clock, there will be a break. Men's rooms are on this side, women's on that side. And we ask you to try to make your stretch and what you need to do quick so that you can come back and we can get underway again at 8.10. Uh, finally, I'd like to say some thanks to our team, Continuing Studies, who's been working very hard to pull this course together. Um, as Dawn will inevitably tell you, there are 28 guest speakers over the next five weeks. I don't think we've ever had a course that's been this rich, this dense, this full, uh, and uh, our staff has been working hard. So sincere thanks to Jack Kirkner, Alex Argeropoulos, Amy Tolafield, Liz Frith, Emma Walker, Hannah Sue, Holly Odofer, and Kylie O'Mara. They're a great team. All right, that's housekeeping. Now, here's a very brief introduction. So welcome to uh, our featured team taught course this fall, Journalism Under Siege, Truth and Trust in a Time of Turmoil. The genesis of this course is probably not hard for you to imagine. I think we are all aware, in fact alarmingly aware, that around the world, journalism and press freedom are facing their biggest challenges in decades. Journalists here at home are being accused of being enemies of the people and of reporting fake news. In countries around the world, they are being imprisoned by the thousands and even killed. Given these stark realities, and being convinced of the absolute necessity of a free and honest press to the survival of democracy, continuing studies in collaboration with the John S. Knight Fellowship Program at Stanford felt that it was our civic duty to convene a forum such as this one, where concerned citizens such as yourselves can learn from professional journalists and engage in conversations that will help all of us understand the challenges that face journalism today. I'm pleased to welcome you tonight and to introduce Don Garcia and Michael Bolton, the directors of the course. Don Garcia is not just the director of the course, she's the director of the John S. Knight Fellowship Program at Stanford. 
JSK, as it's familiarly known, began at Stanford in 1966 and has evolved over the years into one of the most prestigious fellowship programs for professional journalists in the world. Every year, JSK brings between 15 and 20 practicing journalists to Stanford, giving them the freedom to take courses, use our libraries, engage with colleagues at research institutes, and charge their batteries to go back out and write engaged and compelling journalism. In our course this quarter, we will hear from seven current JSK fellows, two of them tonight. Dawn began her career as a reporter and editor for the West Coast newspapers, which includes the San Jose Mercury and the San Francisco Chronicle, where she wrote about politics, immigration, and legal affairs. She's the past president of the organization Journalism and Women's Symposium, a national nonprofit organization that supports the professional empowerment and personal growth of women in journalism. She served on nonprofit boards championing First Amendment rights, social justice, and equality, and sorry, quality journalism, training, and education. She earned her bachelor's degree from the University of Oregon and a master of liberal arts degree from Stanford. She's taught journalism at Bay Area universities and is currently a lecturer in Stanford's journalism program. She herself was a 1991-92 JSK fellow where she studied US-Mexico relations. Her co-director for the course, Michael Bolden, is managing director for communications for the JSK fellowship program. Before that, he served for four years in the Knight Foundation and uh, that was after a 13-year stint on the Washington Post, where he led the development and transportation reporting team and worked as an editor for the Washington Post magazine, Style, and Sunday Arts. He's also worked for the Miami Herald, the Northwest Florida Daily News, and the Times-Picayune from New Orleans. Michael was a fellow in the Maynard Media Academy's Entrepreneurial Leadership Program at Harvard, and earned his BA from the University of Alabama. He's a longtime member of the National Association of Black Journalists, the National Association of Hispanic Journalists, the National Press Club, NLGJA, the Association of LB LGBTQ Journalists, and the Society of Professional Journalists. So without further ado, please join me in, actually it's just Dawn who's going to be responsible for the first half, so you can welcome Michael at 8.10, but please join me in welcoming Dawn Garcia. So welcome, good evening. Uh, I'm Dawn Garcia, the director of the John S. Knight Journalism Fellowships Program, and I'm really happy to be here with all of you tonight. As Charlie mentioned, around the world, journalism and press freedom issues are facing the biggest challenges in many, many decades. Traditional business models are, for media are in decline. Journalists are being accused of reporting what's called fake news. And even more serious, some journalists are being imprisoned and others are even being killed. So we have many questions that we're going to talk about in this series here at Stanford. How are journalists and their institutions responding to the perils that they're facing? What effect are these problems having on the profession and on the quality of journalism and the information that the public receives? And what does it mean for democracy? Tonight is the first of five evenings that we will spend together. In this continuing studies course, which is called Journalism Under Siege, Truth and Trust in a Time of Turmoil. Each of the nights is going to be devoted to issues that are an essential part of our program, the John S. Knight Fellowships Program, and an essential part of journalism. As Charlie mentioned, this is a new collaboration between the Continuing Studies Program and the John S. Knight Journalism Fellowships. I really want to thank Charlie Yunkerman for working uh, with us and his talented, talented staff for teaming up to make this program possible. 
I also want to thank our GSK staff. We have Erica Bartholomew, who's waving there, and Enrico Benjamin here tonight helping us, and, and they will also be collecting cards for your questions. Final shout out to Michael Bolden, who you'll see, uh, he'll be the host for the second part of this evening. He's our Managing Director for Communications, and he's leading the speaker series with me. The second part, Michael will be leading a conversation of reporters and editors around the world who face threats to journalism on the front lines of journalism. Charlie mentioned our program, uh, which we have 17 outstanding fellows here this year, spending 10 months with us at Stanford. They come here with their families from a number of places, and many of them are here tonight. They're from Akron, Ohio. They're from Oakland, California, New York City, as well as uh, Buenos Aires and Belgium and Botswana. Many of them are here. A few of them will be up on stage the second part of our, our uh, evening, and they will be featured in other evenings during our course. So the JSK Fellowships Program, which started more than 50 years ago here at Stanford, was a sabbatical model for journalists to come and take a break. But journalism is not in the state where journalists can take a break anymore. <laughs> so the pace of disruptions uh, have inspired us and the technological change in Silicon Valley and around the world to evolve the program considerably. So uh, these days, fellows do take classes, but they also collaborate with each other and with, with experts in Silicon Valley and Stanford to find new ways to reinvent and reimagine and transform journalism. For this course, we invited and lined up almost 30 speakers, experts, press experts, journalists, media critics to, from around the country to engage in lively conversation with you and us and to en have enlightening lectures for you. And we really enjoyed putting this course together. A couple things I wanted to mention. The experts are going to be talking about a range of issues. A number of the questions that, uh, that Charlie mentioned, a couple of them I'll just say tonight. What's the state of press freedom in the United States and abroad? What's happening to the tra traditional role that journalism has played in a democracy? As technological change accelerates, what's the impact on government and platforms like Facebook and Google, and how the information then flows to all of us in the public? In a time when facts are being called into question, how do we combat the wave of growing misinformation and disinformation? How should journalists cover the growing wave of bias, intolerance, and hate spreading around the globe? And why is there an accelerated decline in the number and strength of local news organizations around the country, including right here in the Bay Area? What does that mean for local communities? And will local news startups fill that void? So those are some of the questions we're going to be talking about over the course of this class. A couple of housekeeping notes. Um, this is a, about more than 250 of you have signed up. We're thrilled to have you here. We appreciate very much your interest in journalism. Uh, there will be time for some questions. Uh, if you have a question, just pass a card to the end of the aisle, and Erica or Enrico will pick it up for you. We will try to reserve about 10 minutes at the end for a few questions at the end of each half of the course. The full syllabus for this course is on Canvas, and along with biographical information of the two speakers sitting next to me and the rest of the speakers for the series. There are articles, books, reports, uh, website links for you to learn more, but none of this is required reading. No quizzes. <laughs> we just hope the material will enlarge your understanding of journalism and give you more information about what's happening today. Each class will be divided into two. Tonight, they're going to be roughly equal. We'll have a break, as Charlie mentioned, at 8 o'clock. And then we could run a little over, heads up, uh, because we'd like to get to your questions. So now we're going to begin. We're, I'm excited to start. Tonight's class is First Draft of History, How a Free Press Protects Freedom. We are looking at how do journalists do their jobs in the face of danger, what happens when they are, are either imprisoned, sadly killed, or silenced in some way. So the two people we have for this discussion, 
are Brian Caravellano, Brian Caravellano, who's the managing editor of the Associated Press to my right. He's the number two executive in the newsroom of the global organization, the Associated Press. He is responsible for the AP's news gathering efforts around the world and in all media formats. And that sounds like not a small job. <laughs> Previously, he was the AP's managing editor for US News and regional editor in Asia. He helped open bureaus in North Korea, Myanmar, and led coverage of Japan's 2011 earthquake, tsunami, and nuclear crisis. He joined the AP in 2000 as a reporter and editor throughout the United States, including Northern California. He told me he really enjoyed living in Marin. And he was also regional editor for the Southern US. He's a graduate of Colby College. Joel Simon, to my left, is the executive director of the Committee to Protect Journalists. It's an independent, nonprofit organization to promote press freedom worldwide, and they defend the right of journalists to report the news without fear of reprisal. He's written on press freedom issues for many publications, including Slate, the New York Review of Books, the New York Times, and he's a regular columnist for the Columbia Journalism Review. Prior to joining CPJ in 1997, as America's program coordinator, he worked for a decade as a freelance journalist in Latin America, covering pi pivotal historical events such as the Guatemalan Civil War, the Zapatista uprising in southern Mexico, economic turmoil in Cuba following the collapse of the Soviet Union. He's a graduate of Amherst College and Stanford University. He has a number of books, and I will, when we get a chance to talk about those after, please join me in welcoming Brian and Joel to Stanford. So we're going to start with Joel, and we asked each of them to give an overview of air, their areas of expertise for, for five minutes or so, five or ten, and then we'll, I'll have some questions, and then we'll open up to your questions. Well, um, I'm going to go first, and thank you so much, Dawn, and you left the most important part out of my resume, which is the work that we did together at El Chocolate, which is a community, uh, bilingual community newspaper in San Francisco where I got my start and where I met Dawn. So it's wonderful to be with you and wonderful uh, to be back here uh, at Stanford. Um, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to try and do a, a sort of history of uh, uh, press freedom in five minutes. So this is not <laughs> going to be easy. Uh, but I, I think that to a certain extent the history of, of, of press freedom is a, is a history of CPJ. And I should probably start out by saying something that's uh, frankly, um, uh, I, I think astounding, which is that if you look at the data, um, in the last, last year, so every year CPJ does a census of journalists in prison around the, la around the world, and last year there were 262 uh, journalists in prison around the world. That's the highest number we've ever recorded. Wow. CPJ has been around since 1981, and we've been documenting uh, this, this, this systematically since 19. 92. So how is it? Why is it that in this particular moment in time, there are more journalists in prison um, than at any time in history, uh, in, in recent history? And I think you have to, again, go back to uh, look, at the, the, look at the last uh, 30 years to understand how we got to this point. So when CPJ was created in 1981, we were, we were started by a group of US journalists to defend the rights of journalists working around the world. Uh, who worked for, without the protection of the First Amendment, who worked, um, uh, who confronted uh, repression and, and violence. And the framework um, around the world for, for repression at that time was the Cold War. So the two greatest threats to, to journalism were state censorship um, that you had in, in the Soviet Union and in China and in many other parts of the world that was justified uh, be, based on an ideology that um, uh, that private media didn't represent um, uh, the, the, the kind of perspective of the people and that the state should control information um, and impose censorship on all views that were not uh, uh, um, uh, directed by the state. And then in Latin America, of course, you had violent conflict uh, in the context of the Cold War in which journalists were targeted, and that was a period of, 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 of massive violence. And then at the end of the Cold War, um, uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, you had this period really in the 90s where there was plenty of violence against journalists. You had the conflict in uh, Bosnia, you had um, uh, the conflict in Algeria in which journalists were targeted, but you didn't have the same levels of state repression. And in fact, you saw an explosion 
of independent journalism around the world. And journalism is a kind of unique institution because it isn't an institution. It can sort of thrive in periods of transition and chaos. And so as these governments were going through these periods of transition where state power um, was uh, reduced, you saw a flourishing of independent journalism and, this, and the ability of state, states to control and manage information was more limited. And then, if you look at our data again, you look at journalists in prison, you see this trough in the 1990s. And then, right around uh, 2000, let me, let, me, let me put it this way, at the end of 2000, there were 84 journalists in prison around the world. At the end of 2001, there were 112. What happened? You have the onset of the war on terror and a new framework for repression, which is anti-terror. And so you see, around the world, governments um, glommed onto this notion that uh, journalism that reports on groups that the government deems to be terrorist groups is supporting journalism, uh, supporting terrorism, aligned with terrorism, and governments repress journalism based on this pretext. And that framework for repression has continued ever since. Um, then you have, during the same period, you have, have a, 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 a global transformation in the information infrastructure because of technology that also unleashed all these powerful forces which, which um, uh, also transformed journalism. It had, it had a number of very positive effects, which of course we um, all recognize and, 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 and to, a, to a certain extent uh, benefit from, which is the ability to access information that was once uh, very limited. Now, of course, we can do that using this technology, but it also uh, sort of ripped apart some of the kind of institutional structures that made journalism powerful. So you saw journalists who, who, who were once part of large institutions, now they were often reporting um, either independently or as, as freelancers or even in, you know, on their own using this technology. And we, we, they created this kind of new global information infrastructure. Uh, a sort of new media ecosystem. And, and yes, there was a, a flourishing of information, but the individuals who were out there reporting that information were uniquely vulnerable. And you also saw um, governments and non-governmental forces that once relied on journalism to get their message out were suddenly less dependent on journalism because they had new ways of disseminating information using this technology. And so you saw an unleashing of violence against journalists and a sudden increase. And you also saw uh, in, in violent attacks. And you also saw governments uh, recognizing the threat of independent information and cracking down on the internet as itself. Um, and so that was the next, the, next, um, the next framework for repression. And now I think we've entered a new one. And, and it's really, uh, it's, there, there, are several, there are several things that are contributing to this new framework for repression. Uh, some of them are, are, are going back at least a decade, which is this new kind of leader, these, these elected autocrats. I, I sometimes call them democratators. Um, <laughs> you know, they're, 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 they're autocratic, but they're elected. So you, yeah. could, you could look at somebody like Vladimir Putin or Hugo Chavez in Venezuela or Viktor Orban in Hungary. Um, but, but there's also, you're also seeing, of course, the rise of, of populist leaders um, in other parts of the world, including in our own country. And um, one, of the, one of the things that, that we've seen throughout this entire period is that Western democracies have been a bulwark. They're, of course, their own records haven't been perfect and they haven't done this systematically, but they've been a bulwark in terms of defending the rights of journalists and press freedom. Of course, in this administration, that's no longer the rubric. And one thing that um, I'm sure Brian's going to talk about, but I just want to make this last point, which is there's a lot of consternation and concern about the fake news framing in the United States and the negative impact that's having on journalism and the increasing polarization we're seeing here. But from my vantage point, it's actually having an even more deleterious effect around the world because it's providing a new framework for repression. We're seeing governments around the world glom onto this framework once again, pat, you know, call for new fake news laws, denounce critical journalism um, as fake news. Um, and one of the things we've seen, um, and I think this is a, a very important data point, um, uh, in, the, in the year since President Trump has, has come to power, 
Um, the number of journalists jailed around the world of what we have historically called false news charges has more than doubled. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was a relatively small number. It was, it was nine at the end of 2016. It was 21 at the end of 2017. But we're definitely entering a new era in which I think the new framework for repression is um, the uh, delegitimization of, of journalism as, as false news and a legal framework for repression that basically uh, parallels the kind of rhetoric that we're seeing from the Trump administration. Wow. Thank you, Joe. So that's, uh, that's kind of the macro view, I guess. I'm yeah. going to give a little bit more of the micro view um, from what things look like inside the AP uh, headquarters newsroom in New York. Uh, as Don said, my job is to try to manage or to manage the, the AP's global news report. And as you can imagine, that requires, it's almost a, a constant barrage these days of safety issues, security issues, standards decisions, consultations with our legal department. Um, it also uh, causes me to spend a lot of time thinking about and focusing on something I never really thought would be part of my job a couple years ago. But, you know, we, we, are, uh, we are very focused on, I guess, you know, uh, news literacy and trying not only to train humans to understand the difference between real news and fake news, but also to train algorithms, which is a whole new field that I you know, have learned far more about in the past couple of years than, than, I, than I ever uh, expected to. Um, just to look at today, I mean, the AP journalists are covering hundreds of, uh, hundreds of assignments around the world today. I'm just going to give you a few examples that I think are relevant. Uh, we have a team on the ground on the island of Sulawesi in Indonesia. Uh, where they're covering the aftermath of the devastating earthquake there. Lots of decisions about safety and security and access and all the things that uh, we're focused on here. We have a bureau in Tehran, um, and uh, they are covering the fallout from a, a, an a attack by Iran's Revolutionary Guard on militant groups inside Syria. We have journalists who have been out covering major protests in the last few days uh, by Catalan separatists in Spain. And even as we speak, I think it's still going on, we're, we're at a Trump rally in South Haven, Mississippi. And I mention that in, uh, in part because I think a few years ago it would have seemed very incongruous to, to mention uh, a US example on a list of things like that. But I think we are all well aware of how the climate toward journalists and journalism have changed in this country uh, and the challenges that that presents. It's, it's definitely a thing that uh, some of the same precautions and concerns that journalists overseas have long faced uh, are now being talked about and have become concerns in U.S. newsrooms. Uh, so, th so we can talk about a little bit more about that later. Um, but working for the AP in particular, it's, it's, it's very hard to, to not um, be very aware of and concerned about the safety of journalists and about journalism access. We are a nonpartisan news organization that takes position on nothing other than issues of press freedom and access and journalist safety. Uh, this is the one thing for which we feel it is right for us to be advocates and activists even, and, um, and, and on nothing else. If you ever come to visit the AP headquarters in Lower Manhattan um, and you walk into our newsroom, and anyone is welcome to do so anytime you're in New York, uh, one of the first things that you see is what we call the Wall of Honor. And the Wall of Honor is a memorial that contains the names of 35 AP journalists who have been killed while reporting the news. And the oldest of these was from, 19, from 1876 when a guy named Mark Kellogg was killed beside General Custer covering the Battle of Little Bighorn. Uh, the most recent ones are from 2014, which was actually an especially bad year. The AP lost four journalists in 2014 uh, and several others who were seriously wounded. Um, and if you look at that wall, and I think this is generally true around the world, visual journalists are disproportionately represented because you have to be there with your camera to document a disaster, a conflict, or a protest. And as a reporter, it's always better to lay eyes on the things that you're writing about. There's no question about that, but it is possible to do that without running into live fire. Uh, it's not really possible for visual journalists to do that. And so if you look at that wall or if you look at the rosters, of journalists who've been killed over the years, photographers and video journalists are represented there in disproportionate numbers. Um, in 2015, our CEO, Gary Pruitt, publicly called for the killing or hostage taking of journalists to be considered a war crime under international law. And here's something that Gary said in a speech then at the Foreign Correspondents Club in Hong Kong. It used to be that when media wore press emblazoned on their vest, it gave them a degree of protection. That labeling now is more likely to make them a target. 
At the time that he was saying this, it was, as you'll all recall, when um, the Islamic State was capturing, kidnapping, and sometimes beheading journalists that had, had taken hostage in Syria and Iraq. So that was a particularly dark time. But for all the reasons that Joel's been talking about, it's pretty hard to argue that in the years since, the climate for doing journalism around the world has gotten a whole lot better. Uh, the public derision of journalists at press conferences and rallies, the whole enemy of the people thing, the dismissal of real facts as fake news. Um, and it's, it's absolutely true that this has not only helped really uh, bring about a decline in the public's trust and faith in uh, reported facts, but it has emboldened other leaders, uh, you know, from Viktor Orban and, and uh, Erdogan um, to even Aung San Suu Kyi in Myanmar uh, to kind of take a page out of that book and to use it as a way to sometimes imprison but certainly repress journalists. And for the longest time, for all of our lifetimes, the U.S. has always been a beacon for free press and has had, I, I, I think you could say, sort of the moral high ground on that front. Um, you know, what the future holds, we don't know. but. Certainly, if you're Erdogan in Turkey sitting there looking at the United States right now, it no longer looks like such a beacon, and you might feel emboldened to do things to journalists in your country that you might not have a few years ago when you're trying to gain access to the European Union and, and, and that sort of thing. Uh, this is also true in small town America and in, in congressional races across the country. You know, people feel emboldened to say and do things to journalists that they may not have a few years ago. Uh, on Friday, um, I attended an event that the Joel's team at CPJ put on, uh, along with Reuters, which is fighting for the release of two of its reporters, Wallone and Chaso U. And they hosted a gathering during the General Assembly at the UN um, in support of these and other journalists around the world who have been imprisoned. Uh, these two were convicted of trumped up charges uh, and sentenced to years of hard labor. Uh, and I have my journalism is not a crime button on from that event. I thought it would be appropriate. Sell those, we could yeah. get a thumb going here. <laughs> but I also, I also want to highlight that, you know, uh, there are unprecedented numbers of journalists who have been kidnapped and imprisoned. Uh, we have seen a lot of journalists killed over the years. For every one of those, there are a lot of near misses. And I, I wanted to focus on that a little bit. Um, I'll give you a few examples from my own world. Uh, my own colleague in Myanmar, Esther Tucson, who was actually the first Burmese journalist ever to win a Pulitzer Prize, uh, had to flee her home country around the same time that Wallon and Cha So-U had been arrested. And she has not been home in more than a year, I think, or close to a year. And I, I think she considers herself the lucky one compared to what's happened to them. But she had people following her home at night. She was getting threatening phone calls. It just got to the point where it no longer seemed safe for her to be there. Uh, we have had, just in the past couple weeks, to evacuate journalists from Yemen and Bangladesh because of threats and or attacks on them. Um, but they got out and they're alive and they're now safe. Um, you know, one is in Cairo, one is in, in Delhi. And I have lots of other examples like this, and I'm not going to belabor this point, but these are journalists who work for a large news organization. The AP, um, while not endlessly resourced, has the resources to act when there is a threat against one of his journalists, if we have enough advance warning. We have a global director of security who happens to be a former deputy director of the Secret Service. We have regional security specialists uh, around the world who work closely with our journalists. They assess the situation on the ground before we send people into a dangerous situation. We have flak jackets and helmets that we can give them when they need them. Uh, and we've had to uh, deploy those in the United States in the last few years. Uh, to cover riots and other things, uh, more than we have in the past. We have a legal department that is outstanding, and they can fight for them. And we also have a really big platform, a huge global audience from which we can advocate for their safety and security. And this is something Joel and I were talking about earlier, that Reuters has done a fantastic job of in highlighting uh, the, what's happened to these two journalists in Myanmar. But what we should worry about the most is the freelancers uh, who don't have this kind of apparatus behind them and who are often younger and sometimes less experienced and don't have necessarily the resources to, um, to get out of a country or to, um, or to avoid getting into the kinds of situations. Um, part of this has to do with the financial challenges that nearly all news organizations face. There just aren't as many job opportunities for people coming out of journalism school or who want to get into journalism. Uh, that has led people to take risks that they may not have taken a generation ago. But when the public is of the opinion that news should be free or should come at very little cost, 
Uh, where is the money going to come from to invest in things like journalist safety and access and all the things that we need to fight for to ensure free press around the world? So that's certainly a problem that we can talk about a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, I think I'll leave it at that. I, I also want to say that I am, I am a rarity, I think, in this business because I'm a lifelong optimist. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I, uh, and I was trying to think of some positive note to end on here in my opening statement, and I, I, I actually don't have one. Um, these are just these are tough times, you know, and uh, I'm encouraged by events like the CPJ one at the UN on, on Friday. I'm encouraged that we're here talking about these things tonight uh, because these are topics, things like safety and access and news literacy, uh, where we as journalists, as I said earlier, we, we shy away from advocacy, but this is an area where we, we need to put up a fight. We need to get out of our sort of defensive position uh, and we need to we need to we need to see this as an area where it's okay to be an activist. Thanks. Thank you, Brian. I want to okay. <laughs> uh, just following up on that. I wanted to uh, talk to you and ask you about that. Do you think the public understands uh, where the United States, where especially U.S. journalism is in in regards to things like press freedom? Um, the, um, the World Press Freedom Index puts the United States at 45 out of 180 countries on the index. So that's right, there are 44 countries, including South Africa, Jamaica, Ghana, a number of countries that are judged by the Reporters Without Borders to be, have a lot more press, press freedom than the United States, um, where we have, it's enshrined in our important document that, we, the, pre, that the press has uh, the right to do what they do for the good of the public. Do, do you? What do, you, what do you think? Do you think people understand that where the United States falls in that? Do you think it's... Um, I'm not sure there's one answer to that. Yeah. I mean, I think it has so much to do with uh, where people live, what their, um, you know, what their access is to, to mm -hmm. good information. I mean, the decline of a lot of local news organizations mm -hmm. uh, have had a, a negative effect on this, I think, in a lot of parts of the country. Mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, maybe here's where my optimistic take can come in. I mean, we, we hear... I, I seem to be the guy that gets all the hate mail at the AP, um, and it stacks up on my desk. I also get a tremendous amount of encouragement and attaboy type stuff from people. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think there is kind of an upwelling. It feels to me like, and I have no science or data or polling to back this up, it feels to me like there's an upwelling of awareness about press freedom issues and that something that we have taken for granted in this country for generations actually is, is worth paying some attention to. Mm -hmm. But I think there are, you know, I, there's a lot of data that shows uh, that faith in media and in journalism is at an all-time low. And so, you know, that shows a different kind of awareness. Right. And I think that's something that we should be very, very concerned about. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask you, Joel, one of the, um, on your list this mm -hmm. year, mm -hmm. the CPJ mm -hmm. list mm -hmm. of journalists um, who have been killed, there have been 43 journalists killed so far this year in 2018. Mm -hmm. um, I <coughs> happen to know two of them. Mm -hmm. um, one, uh, one overseas, one US. Um, just quickly wanted to talk about those two cases and then ask you a bit about mm -hmm. what's going on there. Um, Shujat Bahari, who was the editor of the Rising Kashmir newspaper, in Kashmir, I met at a global editors conference in Lisbon yeah. on June 1st, and we had a good discussion. He was curious about our fellowship, thought about applying, sent me an email when we all got back on June 5th, saying, "I, I think I'll uh, this year. I think I'll try my luck. You inspired mm. me. Let's talk some more." Uh, June 14th, as he stepped out of his office in Kashmir, he was shot, and he'd been given police protection because of earlier mm. attacks on him in 2000. Uh, and this, so this time, he, his two security officers were also killed and disappeared. He was talked about as a voice of moderation, a courageous, big-hearted editor by the Editors Guild of India. And they said, it's a new, low, and a rapidly deteriorating environment for media practitioners in Kashmir and in the country in general. So what's going on in Kashmir that would, he would be a target? Well, actually, our, one of our, our Asian just researcher was just in Kashmir oh. and is lo looking into his killing. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to say that we, we really don't know yeah. what, who, who was behind it mm -hmm. um, and, and, and exactly what their motivation is. And there's, there doesn't seem to be much of an investigation at all, which is hardly surprising. Um, there is some, some uh, sort of um, 
uh, talk that you know may, maybe there were militants, um, and exactly why he was was targeted is not yeah. clear. You know, I, we have had a lot of incidents recently in Kashmir. Um, the conflict there, as you know, sort of ebbs and flows, and right now it's not in the um, sort of global spotlight. But the reality is that conditions for journalists there continue to be extremely difficult. And I will say more broadly about India. I mean, there's 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 a certain uh, amount of attention uh, on the fact that the Indian media, to, to, you know, it's, it, the Indian media based in major cities and Delhi and Mumbai is, has, has grown tremendously as, as the Indian economy has grown and as literacy has increased. Uh, but the reality is that outside of major cities, um, uh, violence against journalists is, is endemic mm -hmm. and that um, um, uh, investigations are rare, justice is rare. And uh, that you also, you know, the, the, the Modi government has also adopted a very, you know, hostile and aggressive mm. posture um, uh, towards the media. So, you know, there are some positive developments yeah. in, in India, but the overall <coughs> picture is, is, uh, is, is difficult. The second person, just to pick out a few, mm. few examples, yeah. um, was not Kashmir or Afghanistan, but a U.S. newsroom, which was yeah. 30 miles from uh, our nation's capital. Um, Rob Hyacin was, uh, had been here at Stanford in 2003-04. He was a JSK fellow in our program and an editor at that time, a reporter at that time, a writer at the Baltimore Sun. Um, he was, uh, I would call him a, a gentle giant. He was a six foot five, mm -hmm. year, uh, an endearing storyteller and a, a generous mentor. And on June 28th, the same month that, mm -hmm. um, the editor from Kashmir was killed. Um, 11 people were in the Capital Gazette newsroom in Annapolis that day. Five of the 11 were killed, including Rob. And uh, it was his wife's birthday. She, they had planned to celebrate when he got home. And he never made it home. Um, why are U.S. journalists being a target? And that was obviously, we haven't had yeah. many killings in well, U.S. newsrooms. But there's been well, some discussion on whether it was it a person who was just angry at the newsroom or was he emboldened in some way by the current yeah. climate? Well, let me say a couple things about that. First, first Dawn, I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry that, yeah. you know, that you um, experienced that. And it's, it's, it's very painful. And it's something I identify with because mm -hmm. you know, a lot of journalists who I meet um, who come to, you know, who I interact with yes. in my role in CPJ are the journalists who are most at risk. Right. And sometimes, you know, I just, it's just a matter of time. Yeah. You know, they, they, they're so, you know, and, 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 and I'm horrified and outraged, but honestly, I'm often inspired by them. Mm -hmm. Because these are journalists, and I'll mention one that, you know, was, is this kind of a recent painful, incident with um, uh, Javier Valdez, who was a very well-known journalist in, in Mexico, uh, lived in uh, Sinaloa and Culiacan, uh, covered the drug beat there. Um, he was a close friend of our organization of CPJ. He knew that you know, he was threatened. We actually tried to work to help him evacuate. And he, he just insisted that he had to stay and, mm. and cover the story. So you know, when these things happen, that's the one thing that consoles me. Um, is that, you know, it's, a, it's astounding to think that a, a, a profession that is so vilified and denigrated and attacked and undermined by our political leaders and this current environment and political leaders around the world that, you know, there are, there are journalists who believe so deeply in this work and this calling that they're willing to give their life. And, you know, I, I do want to say just a couple things about what happened at the Capital Gazette. Um, I, 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 you know, I, I think that you know one of the things that I talked about in the aftermath of that killing was just that you know I went back into our data and I looked at you know who who are the journalists who are at risk and yes you, you mentioned visual journalists and that's one category mm -hmm. another journalist is another another category is local journalists mm -hmm. I mean I don't think people understand how intimate it is to be a journalist in a local community you know so you know you're covering the community you're not you know, anonymous, you run into these people at the grocery store, you know, in every town, you know, whether it's, you know, some, some radio station in the Philippines or some, like, local newspaper in Vermont, there is somebody who's got some terrible grudge against you and is angry and feels um, that they're not treated fairly. 
And you mix that with you know, availability of, of guns, and I'm not just talking about this country, but in many places around the world, mm -hmm. it's, it's easy to obtain weapons. And um, you have a pretty toxic uh, uh, environment. Um, and I, I, I mean, there are incidents that where, where it seems that um, Trump's rhetoric was adopted by people who threatened newsrooms. This does not seem to be the case in the Capitol Gazette. This was somebody with a longstanding grievance. But one thing that is important to note, and this is somewhat anomalous without question, but I think it's a wake-up call. So the three most deadly countries in the world for journalists this year are Afghanistan, number one, Syria, number two, United States, number three. Just let that sit for a minute. Yeah. <laughs> wow. So, so one of the things, thinking, Brian, we talked a little bit earlier about all the things that AP is doing to protect its journalists around the world. Um, and you mentioned you know, black jackets and training and, and all the things that, um, that, that I think had been done a little bit or done a lot more now. What is the AP doing to protect its reporters who are out covering the US political scene where now reporters are seen as the enemy of the people. And there have been some pretty tense moments uh, in the pens there as they're covering rallies and other protests. Yeah, I think, you know, at this point, we're lucky that it's been mostly tense moments. I think a lot of people have seen the video of particularly Jim Acosta from CNN being screamed at at, at rallies. And even going back to the 2016 election, um, journalists were sort of kept in pens at a lot of these rallies and, um, you know, became kind of an object of derision, mm. not just from candidates, but also from, you know, from people who are in the, and it's, it's required, uh, you know, a level of awareness and training among people who cover beats that never really seemed like very dangerous beats in the past, right? <laughs> and I think compared to a lot of the things that we're talking about in places like Bangladesh yeah. or Yemen, uh, you know, it's, it's not, it's not the same, but it's, it's something I think we, we didn't think that we'd be seeing in this country at this point in history. And it's been really eye-opening, and um, and I, you know, as the, Paul, the the day after the midterm elections, the 2020 presidential election is going to begin, and there are going to be a lot of candidates, mm -hmm. and I think a lot of news organizations are going to approach their coverage with much more of a mindful eye about safety and security. Um, you know, you're you're going to have um, a lot of organizations providing training and guidance to political reporters that looks a lot more like what war reporters might have gone through a generation ago. And I, I, you know, and I don't know what that, that says about the, about the climate in this country, but it's, you know, I, I didn't see it coming. I, I, I'm not sure anyone else did either. Right, right, exactly. Um, was there anything from what you talked about that you wanted to, to um, add to? We just have a couple more minutes, either one of you. And well, I want, we'll I, I want to, I want to, one thing I want to, yeah. I want to sort of just um, uh, add to what Brian was talking about. Um, you know, one of the, we, we just had a conversation today, um, earlier this morning, I can't believe it was today, but I was, was, I was in New York earlier this morning, we had, we had a meeting at like, it was eight o'clock, um, uh, and, and we brought in a bunch of journalists, we had a little panel discussion about threats against journalists in the United States, and we're trying to think whether CPJ is an organization, it's time for us to really engage um, with, with those threats, and, and, and kind of raise an alarm. Um, you know, journalists, if you go into this profession, um, you know, you, you, you understand um, that people are going to be angry with you and, you know, you have to have a bit of a thick skin. Um, there's no question that's a, that's a job requirement. Um, uh, if, if, you're, if you're doing a good job, you're, you know, you're going to piss people off at some point. Um, but I think what's, 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 what's different, um, one is um, the kind of um, people are just unleashed online. And the level of vitriol, and it's and it's particularly targeting women, you know that that experience of like reporting well female, um, and having to confront um, that level of hostility and 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 violent, vile language, um, you know there's a question whether that speech is inhibiting other people's speech and and, and whether that's an issue uh, for us. And the other thing that we've seen in our data, which is that you know. That language which people um, encounter online, when you're out there as a journalist covering a demonstration or you're sort of doing street reporting and, and, and there's, a, there's an incident that 
you know, you, you come into contact with, with the public. That same anger is sometimes expressed directly to your face. And so uh, we've seen, you know, we have this, this website we've created called the U.S. Press Freedom Tracker. And we're tracking these incidents in the United States. And I was shocked. We don't have a baseline. So we don't know if this number is higher than what we've seen in previous years. But in the last you know, year and a half, there have been 75 violent incidents uh, against journalists in the United States. So that's, that's you know, I, I, think, I think there's, you know, you put that together with the, you know, with the Capitol Gazette shooting. Yeah. Um, you put that together with, um, you know, some of, the, some of the concerns on the legal front. Um, and I think, you know, I think we're, we're, we're living through a very um, dangerous moment. And, and I think it has repercussions for journalists in this country. And it also has a ripple effect, as I, as I mentioned, you know, in my opening remarks around the world. Mm -hmm. I have two quick stories. Um, one is uh, that day that the Capitol Gazette shooting happened. Lately, there have been so many days where you're watching mm. things unfold and you're thinking to yourself, like, people are going to learn about this in history books. You know, this yeah. is a moment where you really want to pay attention. I will never forget that day because the, the tone in the newsroom was different than on any other day I can remember. And, you know, and we're, we're in New York City. We're far from where this thing is happening. But, um, you know, there's people in the room who knew people who worked there and, you know, who knew Rob Hyacin and, um, and, and people are incredibly professional and they do their jobs and they go about it. But th that day it just felt so different. And part of it was just sort of waiting, like, is this, you know, what happened here? Like, was this mm -hmm. some personal grudge? What it turned out to be or was there some larger political motive here? That day I walked out of the office and NYPD was posted outside of AP headquarters. And across the street from us is what was Time Inc. and is now Meredith. And there were police patrol yeah. there. And, yeah. You know, and they were outside WNYC, and they yeah. were outside the New York Times building, and the NYPD had sort of taken it upon itself to provide an added layer of security at news organizations that day, just in case this turned out to be some sort of larger right. thing. Right. Yeah, and it was like yeah. the sort of thing that just made you want to cry. Um, the other, though, is you know the whole thing about people just doing their jobs. I mean, amid all of this, the most important thing we can do is just do our jobs, yeah. right? I mean, right. Um, if you if you keep doing what you do and reporting the news in ways that are credible and accurate and defensible and all of that, you know, you sort of have to have some faith that that will eventually carry the day. I have a, a really wonderful colleague in who's based in Kentucky named Claire Galofaro, uh, and she covers for us Appalachia, and she covers a lot of, you know, uh, uh, communities of people who are really having a hard time. And, um, you know, those people don't see a lot of, a lot of uh, reporters for national news organizations uh, come by and hang out at their barber shop or their cafe or whatever and talk to them. And she had this story that she told me one time, which was she was interviewing this guy who's going on and on about the media this and the media that, and you know, the mainstream media doesn't get it, and I don't pay any attention to that. And she kind of interrupted him and said, Well, I work for the AP, which is about as mainstream as you can possibly get. And he said, Well, you seem nice. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, to me, that gets to the importance of you've got to get out there and talk to people and engage with them, right? I mean, if you can. You know, it's sort of the, you know, um, you know, think globally, act locally cliche applies, I think, in that as journalists, our individual interactions with the people that we talk to and that we cover still really count. You know, it, 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 not everything needs to be delivered, uh, you know, on massive scale, but individual um, conversations with people really count. And it's really important to me as an editor that we are out in those communities talking to people as much as we possibly can. I mean, on yeah. last Thursday, the day of the Senate Judiciary Committee was another one of those days where I'm thinking, this is something my grandchildren will be learn about, learning about in school. Mm -hmm. We had uh, several dozen people out in communities all across the country just talking to men and women of all races and ethnicities and political, you know, this is not, it's not polling, it's not scientific, but it's really important to get the mm -hmm. voices of people uh, yeah. into your journalism and to have that kind of interaction with people and you know and hopefully that over time has some kind of an impact. Great. Thank you. We're going to go to questions. Michael's got a few for me. Excuse me. Thanks. So the first question, do you think that U.S. journalists have shown sufficient solidarity with one another when a colleague has been harassed or shut down at a press conference by the president or other government officials? Um, well, I mean, I'll take that one. I mean, the first thing I'd say is, you know, in normal times, 
Um, the U.S. media or the U.S. public is well served by a hyper competitive media. You know, it's really hard to get journal. I mean, I, I, I do this for a living, so I know how hard it is. It's hard to get journalists to kind of unite forces. The threat has to be really pronounced. So I, you know, at first I sort of thought, you know, okay, uh, you want you want journalists who are, you know, you know, some, so, you know, you have to understand, you know, what the, we, we see that take place. Um, in the you know, White House briefing room, and that's much that's re essentially a show. There's not a heck of a lot of news that gets made there. Um, there's a lot of grandstanding. There's a lot of dysfunction that we that we all observe. But you know, the, the basic notion that you know it should be difficult to get journalists to kind of uh, come together, I think is I think is correct. But you know, the time has come. The yeah. time has come. You know, we just can't pretend anymore that this is this is business as usual. And there's been a little bit of that. There's been, you know, there's been, um, you know, uh, Fox News has complained when a CNN reporter who was part of a pool was denied access. Yeah. Uh, that we need to see that kind That's of thing. That's pretty exceptional. We need, I think. We, it's yeah. exceptional, and we need to see that sort of thing. Um, you know, where there is where there is a lot of cooperation among media organizations is through the work that we do, where it's real risk of fiscal danger, and you're talking about. Um, you know, uh, overseas uh, deployments and, and threats to, um, to, to journalists deployed in high-risk environments. There's a lot of information sharing, a lot of solidarity, a lot of, you know, the AP sticking up for Reuters and Reuters sticking up for AP. Um, but, but I think the fact that it's difficult to, to, to get the U.S. media to come together is actually a good thing, but I think um, the alarm should have gone, on by now, gone off by now. Okay. I think, you know, we spent a lot of time talking about safety and another huge issue yep. that we spent a lot of time on is access. And then this is an yep. area in which news organizations uh, traditionally do join forces because there's strength in numbers and, you know, that might be, uh, you know, filing lawsuits over, over um, uh, getting access to documents through FOIA or when people get shut out of uh, press conferences and stuff like that. I, th I think on access issues, there, there has been a lot of coalition building historically, um, and I think that's something that we can kind of build on. We all know a lot about what Trump has done for press freedom. We I'm do? not sure I do. <laughs> um, but how did the, uh, the George Bush and Obama administrations contribute Ooh. to the decline in press freedom? Oh, can I? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll, you go first and I'll, well, I'll so have that. that. We, we are, uh, you know, uh, we are, I don't know, 20 years into a, a steady decline in terms of uh, the public's access, particularly to the White House, that began really with the Clinton administration and then the Bush administration. Not that long ago, um, you know, uh, uh, our executive editor, Sally Busby, and me were going to conferences saying the Obama administration is the most media unfriendly uh, administration in U.S. history. And they, you know, they, they, uh, they uh, conducted more leaks investigations and, and put more uh, journalists uh, under subpoena than, than any previous administration. Oddly, um, the access to the Trump administration is actually yeah. better than really? access to yeah. the Obama administration. So, um, uh, journalists have more access to the president and the people around the president now than they did certainly during the second, uh, the second term of Obama. Um, but, you know, that is obviously countered by all the rhetoric, rhetoric about enemies of the people and, and fake news. Uh, it's, it's just different, but uh, you know, it's, it's part of a continuum. It's not something that just started two years ago. It's something that's been in steady decline for a long time, and I think it's important to remember that. Yeah, we did a big report um, called uh, The Obama Administration in the Press in, in 2013, um, written by uh, Len, Len uh, Downey Jr., the, the former executive editor of the Washington Post, that, that chronicled uh, the Obama administration's uh, aggressive uh, leak investigations, including its use of the Espionage Act, uh, this 1917 completely uh, basic, that basically criminalizes um, uh, publication of or, or could be used to criminalize publication of, of, of confidential information, and also the, the you know um, a lot of the people that were interviewed for that report described uh, Obama the Obama administration and Obama in particular as sort of a control freak who had amazing he, you know the thing yeah. the thing about covering the Obama administration during that period is he was he was a very effective manager and he hated leaks 
And he did a pretty good job of stamping them out and of you know, investigating mm -hmm. people within his administration who leaked. And he also understood the new dynamics of the media, and he did a lot of end runs around the media. So if he wanted to you know, talk to a specific audience, he might forego a media interview and do you know, Between Two Ferns or go on, you know, you know, right. on uh, Jon Stewart or something. And so this drug journalist absolutely around the bend. You know, let's, let's keep something in mind about Trump. Yes, he attacks the media all the time. People don't like that. But his administration leaks like a sieve. <laughs> everyone is talking to everyone. Yeah. There's plenty of access. Yeah. And he does nothing but watch television all day long. <laughs> He's obsessed with the media. So like journalists under Obama felt slightly irrelevant. And under, and under Trump, they don't like being called the enemies of the people. They don't like being screamed at. But Trump is obsessed with traditional media coverage at least they feel relevant. Yeah, I mean, let's not forget the Obama <laughs> Justice Department wiretapped the AP and it's didn't tell us about it until after they had exactly. already gotten the results they wanted out of that, and they used it to, to flush out a leaker who's now yeah. in jail. Great. Yeah. So. Great. I have time for one quick one. Uh, what is the obligation of news organizations to protect freelancers, moral slash ethical, if not legal? Well, I'll, I'll take that one first. I mean, I, I think that... Um, I want to go back to a point I made at the beginning, which is about what I call you know, the, the, the information ecosystem or the media ecosystem. So we're, we're, we're no, we no longer live in a period in which you know, information and, and news organizations are hierarchical, where you have like your editors and you have your, your correspondents deployed and everything filters up. You know, the, the, kind of, the, the information networks that allow us to be informed um, are very horizontal, and they include uh, freelancers, and people are very focused on that. But I would then talk about the next step, which is when you're talking about it from the perspective of people in this room or an international news organization, local journalists. If you are working in, you know, where, where they're working in Myanmar, or you're working in, um, you know, in Mexico, or you're working in Nigeria, you know, and you, the, the information that you uh, have access to that you report for a global audience comes from the local press. So they're part of that information ecosystem, and so are because of technology, you know, what what you might call. Um, uh, you know, eyewitnesses who document and, and record what they see and share that information via social media. That makes it into this information stream. I think, certainly from my perspective, that we should have the broadest possible vision of all of these people who are contributing to our, uh, our, our, our global understanding and have a robust framework for defending uh, all of their rights. Um, I, I think it's absolutely essential to see to see ourselves as journalists as part of a, a, a much broader um, network of, of people who, who gather and disseminate information to the public. Yeah, we don't really differentiate. I mean, we work with freelancers all around the world, and if, you know, if you're working for us and a story that you write or, or, or shoot um, gets you into a lot of trouble in your home country, we feel what we have an obligation to protect you no different than if you're a, an employee, a full-time employee of the AP. There's a whole nother realm here that I think is um, uh, just, it's, it's really a, a burgeoning issue for a lot of news organizations, which is that there are parts of the world in which our view isn't, mm. isn't professional journalists or freelancers, it's, it's people. You know, yeah. uh, a, a lot of what we have seen out of Syria over the last few years right. is user-generated content. Yeah. Yeah. And um, it's certainly possible that someone who shoots a piece of video or takes a picture that ends up getting published around the world by the AP or Reuters, the New York Times, might put themselves at risk by doing that. And it's very much got to be part of the conversation, not only, you know, did you take this and, you know, are you willing to, um, you know, are, are, do you understand uh, uh, all the rights, the copyrights and the, and the implications of distribution, but are you in a place now where you're safe so with the, when this gets published that you're not going to suffer some repercussion for it? And I think this is something a lot of news organizations yeah. are struggling with, even beyond the freelancer question, is what is your obligation to the safety of people who provide you with user-generated content that you might not be paying for at all? Right. Well, let's give a round of applause to our speakers, to our clients.